Thanks for pressing play. You're listening to the Brody Windsor Group on Real Estate, the podcast for homeowners seeking guidance and support on everything related to owning a home. This includes much more than just buying or selling. We've got you covered for everything from mortgages and financing to home maintenance tips, renovation and design advice, and of course, the latest insights and analysis on what's happening in our local communities. Today, we're going to be talking about everything about residential roofing and uh, things that every homeowner should know about repairing, maintaining, and replacing their roof. How you doing, Stefan? Great to have you on the show. Yeah, I'm doing awesome. Thanks for having me. It's our, our off season right now, so we had some extra time to sit down and catch up. Yeah, it's great. Did you get to the gym this morning? I did. We missed you. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I was here preparing, and uh, you, were, you yeah, were putting in the work. you're diligent. Good for you. <laughs> hey, so before we jump in and pop the hood on you know all the tips and advice for homeowners about residential roofing, uh, I want you to tell us a story about, you know, how you decided to start a roofing business in the middle of a pandemic. Well, that's a good question. Um, definitely wouldn't be everyone's first choice of things to do, but I think I had. Uh, so I, I I went to school at Queens. I actually studied science. I always thought I was gonna go on to like a professional career in either medicine or law or something like that. But at, somewhere along the way, I was introduced into the world of business and entrepreneurship. And um, through, you know, student painting, I basically gained a a pretty unique skill set of how to operate and run a service based business from a customer service, a production recruiting point of view, all those skills that go into it. And uh, so I was offered the opportunity to come and start the Rydell franchise here in Montreal in the West Island. And I thought it was a perfect fit, even though it was a bit of a bit of a scary time. But Ultimately, every single house anywhere has a roof, whether it's a flat roof, a shingle roof, a metal roof. And um, I noticed that it was an opportunity to enter an industry where you could maybe say that they're a few years behind um, in terms of the technology that's used, the the customer service side of the business, you know, being a reputable company. And just I, th- I thought there was a big opportunity there to come in and make a mark and build a business quite quickly which is what we've done over the last few years. Well, that's interesting you said that because uh, in our business, you know, we see a lot of contractors out there and in the roofing industry, it seems that most of the times the roofing companies, it's it's either a family business that's been sort of passed down from generation to generation, or it's uh, somebody who was a roofer, learned the trade, and then decided to, you know, <laughs> pardon the pun, but you know, put up their own shingle and, totally. and and start their own business, but they don't really have that business background in terms of the systems and, and process and procedures. So is that something that sort of has given you an advantage and the, the franchise system going into Rydell, you know, t- has that helped you sort of run more of a, of a streamlined business? Yeah, well, don't, don't get me wrong. There's obviously quite a few other good roofing companies out there, super competent installers that run a tight ship and you know, have an awesome business overall. But I think um, I approach it from a bit of a unique perspective, not growing up in the business as as a roofer. I sort of saw the other side of it of a lot a lot of times homeowners are in more of a vulnerable position with the roof because they can't get up on the roof. They might not know that much about it. And it causes a lot of stress when you're having problems with your roof. So there is a, you know, a big responsibility there to give good advice and, and be reasonable in a sense. Um, but I think the franchise model is something that I was always comfortable with because not only is there myself and and like my team at a local level, but we also have our head office that's in Ottawa, whose sole job is to brainstorm and put money into ways of improving our business. And like one example of that is this, this year where we have a, like a beginning of year conference, uh, at around this time. And one of the cool things we're doing next year is we're going totally paperless in our estimating system. So all of our samples, we're going to have models that we can show people what their houses will look like. All of our estimates, it's all going to be done on, on iPads. And um, not only is that sort of the way of the future, but it gives, uh, I think, gives us an edge for sure. Well, for sure, because we, we just experience it ourselves. When we're, you know, reaching out to you on behalf of clients, the responsiveness is right there. You know, it's like your scheduling is on point. Um, like you said, your quotations are clear and detailed and it's not like something's written just, you know, uh, chicken yeah. scratch that you're trying to, you know, figure out what, what's going on and it's hard to compare. So yeah, that's definitely uh, an advantage I'd say. 
Yeah, hundred percent. I think at the end of the day, it just comes down to maintaining a high overall level of integrity in your business. So whether that's showing up on time, rescheduling appointments, if you can't make it, just being in communication overall with your clients and, you know, delivering your service in a timely manner, especially when people are trying to sell their homes or trying to, trying to buy a new home, or they're just in their family home and have an issue. Um, nobody likes to wait around too long to get their roof fixed. So absolutely super important. Um, we got to, I got to ask you about one, one thing, and it's an interesting story. And I'd, I'd like you to tell us sort of what was the reaction like from your family when you decided, you know, and you told them, Hey, uh, I'm not going to be, uh, going down the, the, the path to med school. And uh, guess what? I'm going to be, you know, open up my own roofing business. Well, that's a, <laughs> that's a good question. I do get that from time to time. And a lot of clients get a kick out of it, but ultimately, I mean, luckily my parents aren't, aren't too strict in sort of governing that. And I, I, I softened them up a little bit with the, the painting business for a few summers, but, um, I think when it just came down to it, I had, had been on a certain path for quite a while that you feel an obligation almost to go to school these days. And that's what most people do is they at least go and get a bachelor's degree. But I was going into university at 17 years old because I have a really late birthday. I hadn't even gotten any sort of exposure to the world of entrepreneurship, business, and what you can do as your own boss to sort of create your own career. And as soon as I got a taste for that, ultimately I just kind of fell in love and I've never stopped since. So I would say that looking back on it all, they're, they're pretty happy and, and okay with everything. Well, it's very cool. And I think you actually can you know, combine the two. It's like, I think right now you're almost known as the roof doctor in, yeah. in, in our local <laughs> circles, circles, eh? Exactly. <laughs> Cause you're able to diagnose those problems and then you really prescribe the right solution. Totally. You got to do some investigating, find out where it hurts and then get it fixed. Awesome. All right. Now let's get into it. I think the first thing I wanted to get into was from, uh, you know, repairs, uh, to maintenance and things like that. What's the most common calls you get from homeowners, homeowners? Um, we get all sorts of calls, whether it be crazy situations or just proactive homeowners who want inspections and who want the peace of mind to know that everything's okay. But I would say, um, in terms of repairs, we get a lot of calls just due to minor leaks, whether it be chimney flashings or there's a big storm, people lose shingles, the roof starts leaking, things that are relatively easy to fix. Um, we also get quite a few calls from just overall roofs that need to be redone or roofs where homeowners think there might be a repair. And then ultimately we're able to sort of gather from getting up on the roof that it's not going to be economically responsible to repair the roof. It just really just needs to be redone. Unfortunately, that's the case sometimes. So, um, yeah, we do all sorts of stuff. We do heating cables, inspections, just generic repairs and, and re roofs as well. So what would you say are the most important things that a homeowner should do? Uh, to prevent leaks and extend the life of their roof? That's a good question. I think first and foremost, just being aware and, and being diligent with sort of keeping your paperwork. A lot of people don't even remember when their roof was done last. They don't know what the product is. They don't know what the company is that did it. So that's kind of like the trifecta there where you're, you're back to square one and you just have to fully hire a new company. You don't have a warranty at that point. So being aware and understanding what the rough timeline of a roof is, like generally in Montreal, unless it's a metal roof or a permanent roof, you can't really expect to get more than 20 years on the high end from a, a shingle roof. And that's, that's pushing it. So I would say most of the roofs we're replacing, they're in between 10 to 15 years. So I think there can be quite a lot. That's, that's, that's a big range from 10 years to 15 years. And what you could do to push to that 15 year mark would be having inspections when the roof is older. Generally the first five years of the roof, you can assume unless there was something that was done wrong, it's going to function properly. But when it starts to get to that 10 year plus mark, um, yearly inspections are a really, really good idea. There are consumable aspects on any roof, such as caulking, um, flashings that can be inspected. Perhaps the ventilation wasn't done correctly and that can be upgraded. All these factors sort of combine into what the overall lifespan of the roof is going to yeah, be. Yeah. I think we see it all the time. Inspections, the number one thing, uh, that people neglect is caulking totally you know, around flashings, doors and windows and yeah. on the roof as well. Yeah. And with the roof, it's not like windows or siding where you can visibly see it. You see it every time you walk into your, into your home, 
or you walk out the backyard, there's a lot of houses where either because they're lower slope or they're too high, um, you can't even see the roof unless you're up there. Or if it's a steeper roof and it's just not possible for a homeowner to really go up on it at, at all, um, then you you kind of relying on hiring a professional to go and do that. Now, how often should this be done? How often should they be inspecting the roof? I'd say any roof that's over 10 years old should be inspected on a yearly or a bi-yearly basis. Um, any roof that's in that zero to 10 range or especially zero to five, I would go on more of a three to five year um, repetition of an inspection. And then once it's kind of 15 to 20 years, you would want to be super diligent on being on top of just knowing all the liabilities on the roof and, and really looking into getting it replaced. So what would you say are some of the biggest mistakes that home ma homeowners make when it comes to maintaining their roof? Well, there's a few that we see quite often. I mean, number one is just sort of having that out of sight, out of mind mentality of, I hear it very commonly, oh, it can go another year, it can go another two years. We had it inspected five years ago and they said it's gonna last for seven years. Meanwhile, there's so many variables that can change. And if you're not getting up on it to look, then how do you really know? Um, so that would be number one. I think a lot of times um, there can actually be issues going on underneath the hood, so to speak, that you may not be aware of. There might not be water showing up in your bedroom or your bathroom, but that doesn't necessarily mean that like plywood isn't rotting and there's actually infiltration. It just might not be showing up in the home. So a lot of roofs that we tear off almost every single one, there is some area that was leaking. It's just a lot of them are fortunate enough not to show up inside the home or they might be leaking out the soffit um, or the water is just in, soaking into the insulation or resting on the vapor barrier. Um, but that's another very common one is I'm, I'm told quite often, oh no, the roof's not leaking, it's fine, there's no rush. But unless you're jumping up in the attic, you're, you're looking at everything with a flashlight under a microscope, it is very hard to make that statement without a shadow of a doubt. So that would be another big one. Because I think you told me that before is like, by the time you actually have a leak coming through in the inside of your home, it's too late. It's been, it's probably been leaking for, for years yeah. uh, before it actually becomes visible. Yeah. Unless it's a result of a, like an ice storm that we had last year or a wind storm and there's something that changes in the moment, um, that is very likely the case. So this brings us to the, 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 the most popular question. How long should my roof last? Yeah, so that's for sure. It's a controversial topic. Um, I'll be speaking mainly in regards to like asphalt shingles, specifically the older generation roofs that we replace most of the time. So these shingles, they're called three tab shingles. A lot of people have heard of them because of lawsuits against BP and older companies for, for the organic shingle, which was essentially a model that was expected to last a lot longer than it did and it failed. So there was a class action, but a general rule of thumb, I would say, is we're looking, we're replacing roofs anywhere from 10 years to 15 years of age. So if you're in that, that kind of range, it's pretty much fair game. And there's a lot of factors that will influence that, like the ventilation, the sun exposure, um, how the roof is maintained. But I would say you're sort of in that nine or 10 to 15 years. If you get any more than that, you should consider yourself lucky and you really got your money's worth. And how do you tell? What are the what are the signs to look for? So there's some really, really easy, visible signs and symptoms that you can identify. Number one, anytime you, you see a roof where the shingles are actually curling, um, that's kind of like a late stage failure where it's very close to replacement. Usually this will happen on the south side of the roof first. Um, other common signs and symptoms are if you're cleaning out your gutters and you see a whole bunch of little rocks and stones that have fallen off the shingles, it basically means the granules or the protective outer coating, they just get washed off over time. So picture 10 to 15 years of rainstorms, they just can't hold on anymore and they start falling off in the gutter. Or a lot of times people have them on their barbecues or their patio, their back deck, and they're wondering what are all these stones that are lying around my house? I keep sweeping them, mm -hmm. they keep coming back. Um, so that would be that would be a big one. Any Anytime there's a leak or a water infiltration, that's a very obvious sign that that can't be ignored. Um, and so, yeah, those would be, those would be the main. And you mentioned South side would probably, because of the, the sun would probably contribute to them, those, those shingles wearing out quicker than the rest. Is it a good idea to replace one section of the roof before the other, or 
should you be waiting and doing it all at once? That's a very, very common situation and scenario. Almost any house like the south or the west side is sitting and baking in the sun significantly more than the other side of the roof, which is in the shade. So yeah, we we have a lot of times we hear from homeowners like half the roof is looks brand new, but the other one, the shingles are falling off. So when you're deciding about this, I would say, first of all, 90 to 95% of people just get the whole roof done. The main reason for that is just like with the economies of scale, running a roofing business, if you're doing it half and half, you're basically paying them twice to come and set up all their gear, to bring the trailer to the job, to get a dumpster, when normally those costs wouldn't be doubled up if the roof was all done at the same time. So it can be an okay plan if you know the budget is tight, if there's other major renovations or things that have to take priority, but you know you need to do the one side, then you're probably eating somewhere in between 500 to $1,000 that you would have saved if it was all done at once. But generally we would recommend keeping the roof on the same maintenance scale. Hmm. Because if there's five years that separate the front and the back and when they were done, kind of creates a conundrum down the road where your roof's always like mismatched. It's never on the same time scale. So that would be the other thing uh, to think about. And I guess you might have an aesthetic uh, issue to deal with too. If, if you're, you're gonna have to try and choose the same uh, style shingle if that doesn't, totally. if that's not still in stock, that might be maybe difficult to do and you don't want to have sort of a mismatch of shingles out there, right? Yeah. Like colors and, and, and product lines get recycled all the time. Even since COVID started, we've seen some shingle companies condense, um, two different product lines into one, or they just completely eliminate colors because they're just not popular. They want to put their raw materials and their resources into making the 10 colors that get used all the time, not the four that are seldom used. So that's that's a really valid point as well. And the other point that you just made me think of, which is when you're replacing the roof is, you know, if you're doing the whole roof, even though half the roof is probably not yet at the end of its life, um, just because it's more cost effective. Well, where's all that stuff going? Is it is, is all is this going into landfills? And I think, you know, is, is, is the industry as a whole um, developing and innovating to try and reduce the amount of waste that goes into landfills from re-roofing projects? Yeah, not as quickly as one might like. Um, there's God knows how many asphalt roofs getting torn off every single day in the summer that all that is going straight to the landfill. Sometimes we go to jobs that were done three years ago that were botched and we have to tear those shingles off that are almost brand new. So there's a, yeah, it's a huge problem. It's not sustainable at all. The nice thing is there, there's some pretty um, good ingenuity going on in terms of actual economical or environmental products that we can put on people's roofs. Um, one category of that would just be any type of metal roofing is head and shoulders above an asphalt shingle roof in terms of the longevity, it basically lasts twice as long. So you're eliminating one roof replacement that goes into the landfill right off the bat. Mm. It also makes your home quite a bit more energy efficient. Um, when the material eventually does reach it, its uh, its lifespan, it can be recycled instead of just thrown in the dump. So that would be one category. And then one of our hallmark products that is actually specifically recycling material to make it is called the Euroshield. So this is a really cool product. It's a rubber shingle. It comes in two different molds, either to look like slate or to look like cedar shakes, which are two beautiful styles yeah. of roofing. And the way it's actually made is with 95% recycled materials, which I believe 85% of those are from recycled car tires. So they're taking all these tires that would normally go to a landfill and repurposing them, putting it into a mold and making this shingle that not only looks beautiful, but it lasts it has a 50 year guarantee on it that's non prorated. So it's a full guarantee and, um, you know, add some value to your house. It's extremely durable to any sort of impact. So the reason this product was, um, conceptualized was in the States and in other areas where there's more severe weather, you'll actually get hailstorms where metal roofs just get totally scrapped. They get dented, they get scratched. The hail can actually go through shingle. And if you look up Euroshield hail tests, they'll have, um, you know, a regular shingle on one side, Euroshield on the other with the Euroshield, the hail stone up to maybe four inches just bounces off. Whereas the shingle, it goes right through. Yeah, so that's super cool. I mean, you, I've, I've seen, uh, examples you've shown me and it looks, it looks beautiful. It's a, it's a great product, quite a bit more expensive though. So there, there's where we get into, 
you know, when it comes to replacing a roof, the different options available to homeowners. And when I, when I ask you sort of what's the best material, I think what you've, you've told me is, well, it depends, right? Yeah, that's not a, a one size fits all decision. Um, we usually like to ask quite a few questions around the topic to sort of determine whether it makes sense for us and a homeowner to focus any time at all on looking at permanent roofing. Um, but the nice thing about working with Rydell is that we do do both. So we're not biased in any way, shape or form of pushing them towards asphalt because we only do asphalt shingles or pushing them towards metal because we only do metal. But some of the most common um, things that we, we look at and talk about, number one be, of course, budget. Um, the metal roofing tends to be starting in and around the twice the price of what a regular asphalt shingle roof would, call, would cost. However, like I said, the warranties for metal roofing products or permanent roofing products start out at the 40 to 50 year mark. Um, so you have to take that into consideration, but budget's definitely number one. How long the, the family or the homeowner is planning on staying in the home? That's another big one because if you're gonna move out in five years, if it's not a forever home or at least doesn't have a chance of being a forever home, in a very short amount of time, I get asked a lot whether you'll you'll make the you'll recoup the investment. You definitely will not if you're moving in five or ten or fifteen years. Generally, when it makes sense is if you're gonna be in your house in that 15 to 20 year time, you would have to go go ahead and replace the roof again. And if you factor in what inflation is gonna do between now and then, even on a conservative side, you're gonna be paying quite a bit more to do those two actual shingle roofs than just the one permanent roof at this current point in time. And that's probably gone up recently <laughs> with, the, with, with the recent in inflation over the last couple of years. Yeah, I mean, any types of metal that are used like aluminum, steel, copper, like all this, is just continually increasing in price. So technically when it's on your house, it is appreciating in some sense. Um, yeah, but it's not It's not getting cheaper. Yeah, and you mentioned too, sort of the different um, you know, materials that are being used in roofs. And I know we've, we've ran into it a few times in residential homes that have two different types of roof. They've got the regular sloped shingle roof, and then they have some portions that would be a flat roof. Talk to us a little bit about the difference between the two and what kind of specialization uh, a roofer needs to deal with those. Totally. So the first thing you need to understand is when a roof is flat and it doesn't have that gradient, the only reason shingles work and function is because the water is, is being directed off of the roof. It's not, there's no standing water, it's not sitting there. So as soon as you get on any type of a surface where there can be pooling or it's just so low of a slope, that when it rains, the, the water droplets are sitting on the roof. It gives an opportunity for them to back up underneath shingles and shingles are no longer a viable solution. You're going to get a leak, something like it's not going to, it's not going to work. So what we then would recommend to a homeowner would be, um, a elastomeric or a torch on roofing system, where basically it's, it's what you call a two ply system. So there's a base membrane and then there's a top membrane and these two membranes, essentially they get fused together. Um, using heat application with a blowtorch and it creates a seal that even if there is water sitting on the roof, it's never going to get in the seams. But a lot of times companies that do asphalt shingles, they don't have the insurance to work with the fire. They don't have the training to install this particular type of roofing material. So they may sort of skimp out on educating a client on what the best possible solution is because they don't happen to offer that solution. So it's for sure, it's one thing if you, you do have uh, a flat roofing section on your home to just question your roofing contractor a little bit more like, hey, do you have fire insurance? Are you gonna be using a peel and stick system or are you gonna be using an actual torch on system that's applied with heat? And it never hurts just to hire another company that does specialize in that if the one you had hired to do your shingles don't. Because I remember we, I had a client that I referred you to and I think they had the BP shingles that were completely toast. And, yeah, it was wrecked. But, but that they also <laughs> had uh, a portion that was that was a membrane. Uh, I don't know if it was a. And that, this was the, I, if you, if you recall, like what was the situation there? Because that was like a I think of the peel, peel and stick type of uh, flat roof where you you would sort of uh, looked at that and said, no, this is not the right. Solution, yeah, well, right? it was it was basically a home where you couldn't really tell from the ground, but a large section of the top of the roof had a flat roofing membrane on it and the other company that was quoting them there was quite a price discrepancy between us and them and the main reason why was because of the type of flat roofing technology they were using which 
it wasn't the the heat applied one it just relied on two membranes sticking together by themselves mm. and over time you can see that start to bubble you can see ice and snow is able to get under it because when it gets cold throughout the the freeze thaw like that we see here it just doesn't stick together as well so yeah sometimes unfortunately homeowners aren't totally well informed about the two differences and the distinctions between those or sometimes they may not even know that there is a flat roofing component to their house so how about if a homeowner is pretty proactive and they want to you know go and check up uh, and see what's going on in their attic what would you advise them to look for in terms of things that could be a potential problem yeah, that's a great question. We'd love to see it. Anyone who's willing and able, it definitely helps us out. We can get more information just off the hop. So what I would say we look for in attics is, first of all, trying to look around any areas where there's maybe a chimney or there's a plumbing flange or there's a vent or any type of penetration that's going through the roof deck. Those can often be the areas where leaks tend to happen if something's not done right. Or if there's a valley where two areas are converging. That's where a lot of the water and the snow and the ice sit. So doing a quick scan of, of those areas just to, first of all, look for if there's any evident moisture. If it's wet and you actually see water, then that means there's a leak currently going on. If you see, sometimes you can see the roof deck underneath is stained or it looks like there's a water stain, but it looks dry. This can either mean there there could have been a leak two, two roof times, lifetimes ago, or, the, or it could be a leak that was fixed and has now dried up and it has stopped. So when you do when you do see water staining underneath your roof, if you're looking in the attic, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is a current leak. It could have been from something that was there before and has since been fixed. Uh, other things that you can look for, just sort of feeling around if there's any insulation that's wet in a particular area or you actually see any water standing like on the vapor barrier, that's obviously not a good sign. That should be investigated. And if from time to time when there's leaks that have been going on or there's a ventilation issue, if you feel that there's quite a bit of moisture in the attic, um, that could mean that there's an issue either with the ventilation or the air intake. And if that's not addressed for a long period of time, that's going to lead to some pretty significant mold buildup. So that's a big one for sure. So I know this from personal experience. Um, the other one is looking at the block soffits because you mentioned ventilation yeah. right and so that might be another one if you're going into the attic and you can't see you know light coming through from the edges of the roof that may mean that the insulation is blocking the soffits and there's and i know again you sort of work uh in collaboration with insulation ex experts right because we want to look at the roof as an entire system maybe you could expand a little bit on that yeah so i would say there's three or four different categories or trades that kind of combine into having a roof function properly. First of all, your attic needs to be insulated properly. What this does is it stops in the wintertime when you're cranking your heat, trying to keep your house warm on those really cold days. If you don't have good insulation, all that heat is going to be going through into the attic and heating your attic, which is going to cause a lot of melting up on top of the roof, which you definitely don't want. That's going to lead to ice buildup. So number one would be insulation. And that's and also I've heard in, in older homes too, the old pot lights, you know, if they're not LED pot lights, the old pot lights would generate a ton of heat. Totally. And if they're not insulated properly with the boxes in the attic, you're getting heat going right through there. Yeah. So if you know, if that's something that needs to be updated, then that's a little thing that you can do that can have a huge impact. The second thing would be the ventilation points actually on the roof. So there should most homes have what we call maximum tower vents. Uh, they're pretty easy to see sticking over the ridge of your roof or in the attic, you'll see a big 12, 12 inch by 12 inch hole. And you can almost, if you put your hand next to them, you should be able to feel air flowing out through those. So those allow air to escape from the attic, but for those to function properly, you also need air to be coming in at the soffit or at the bottom, the edge of the roof. Now that can be one of the biggest complications that we see where either as we've experienced together, insulation is pushed all the way down to the edge of the roof and it's totally covering your soffit so no air can flow in. Or with a lot of older homes in the West Island, underneath your metal uh, perforated soffit, there's actually wood there that was never cut out or never removed from 50, 60 years ago. 
And in that case, it's just totally blocking any air from flowing into the attic. Yeah, I had that in my little bungalow. Anything built in the 50s, yeah. good chance that those, those soffits are blocked. At one point, they were. It's just a question of whether someone took the time in the past, either a roofer or a siding guy or a soffit fascia gutter guy, whoever put those metal soffits on would have seen that there was no ventilation there. So that's one opportunity to fix it. Yeah. The other opportunity to fix it is when you're having your roof redone, we can also gain access and, and cut out that wood so that the air flows in. Other common uh, issue we see, especially in older homes, is the gable vents, which before the introduction of the maximum vents, right, they would have gable vents on the side of the home. Um, but now after installing uh, the maximum vents with a new roof, they often forget to close off the gable vents. So that's an issue that comes up on inspections all the time. Yeah. And it's not one that's too difficult to fix, but any A-frame home, old bungalow, if you look at the the two sides of the house, you'll see this grate or this triangle shaped grate where that actually used to be one of the functioning roof vents, like you said. In that case, we would just go on the interior of the attic and close them up with plywood or planks or some sort of material to stop air flowing through there. And the reason is because you want the air coming from the soffits and getting sucked up through the maximum vent at the top, correct? Yeah, like you basically, you have this differential of um, where there's air that can move in from the edge and out through the maximum vent. And, and if you have on either side of that, two other points where air can move in and out of the home, it's gonna disrupt disrupt that flow and it's not gonna function correctly. And in terms of temperature, what should the ideal temperature be in your attic? So in the winter time, you, want, you do want your attic to be as cold as possible. Uh, this can be controversial what some, some people might have thought. However, the reason being like I mentioned before is if you have a whole bunch of hot air in your attic and it's not insulated, it's not ventilated, it's gonna cause all the snow on your roof to melt. That snow is going to turn into water. It's gonna run down to the edge of the home. And at the edge of the home, it's gonna freeze because it's quite a bit cooler down there. Now it's on the exterior, it's on the, the area where it's the soffit, and it's gonna form this huge buildup of ice, which we call an ice dam. So oftentimes in the winter, if you drive around and you look at homes with poor ventilation or poor insulation, You'll see icicles, all this huge ice buildup, tons of icicles hanging down. Sometimes they can even be five or six feet long. And that's generally a sign that something's not right. Yeah, because some people go, oh, the icicles look beautiful, it's <laughs> yeah. great. But I'm a perfect example. I live in a split and I think this, the, the design and style of, of my roof is such that uh, I'm, I have many more problems than, than most roofs with that ice damming problem. So, right. Maybe explain again, what are the different steps that we can go through to address that ice damming problem? Yeah, so if you do happen to look outside your window and see a whole bunch of icicles, uh, first and foremost, that, that can actually cause uh, relapsing and remitting leaks throughout the winter. So we can remove those. We do do ice dam removal, where we actually come and just physically get that ice off your roof. So that can help in the meantime. But the best thing to do would be once the spring or the summertime rolls around, you wanna have those three factors I looked at mentioned, that I mentioned before looked at. So it's either gonna be your roof doesn't have enough maximum vents or it doesn't have enough exit points for the ventilation or the insulation's not good enough, at which point you could have a company that specializes in that add insulation. Or the third one would be your soffits are blocked. So it's gotta be one or two or all of those things that are combining together to cause that melting effect and have the ice build up at the edge of your home. And then one final last resort, if that's not enough and you're still having those problems, I know I've done it, is use the heating cables. Yeah, I mean, they're never uh, never a bad option. There are certain houses that are inherently prone to ice damming. A lot of mansard homes, which we see all over the West Island, those we, we try all sorts of different things to try and improve the ventilation and it doesn't always work. So what we would do in that case is we would go and, and purchase heating cables which is basically a wire, an insulated wire that sits on your roof, it clips on the shingles. You can plug it in when, when it gets cold and when there's a lot of snow. And that will just help to carve a channel where the water can drain off your roof. It doesn't completely eliminate snow or ice, but it melts it and it allows it to drain off. Yeah, and it, it runs through the gutters as well. So yeah. your gutters don't fill up with ice and you've got a place for that water to go when it does melt, right? Yeah, and most of the time we're installing those on, on townhouses, mansard houses, just the the design of the house itself just makes it so that there's nothing we can do to have it function perfectly. So we put those as uh, just a safety 
mechanism. There's one other thing we see again, uh, especially in older homes that haven't been renovated. Bathrooms didn't used to have uh, you know fans with exhaust oh, yeah. fans going through the roof. So the gooseneck vent <clears throat> going through the roof, sometimes you don't see those. And, and sometimes they've put in a fan, but they've just uh, stuck a, a vent into the attic, right? And they haven't gone all the way through the roof. Yeah, we do see that from time to time. It's kind of funny, but basically in that case, whenever you turn on your bathroom fan, it's just blowing hot air into the attic. Not a good thing. Causing problems for you. So again, it's a pretty simple fix once you identify it. A lot of times we do try and check in people's attics and stick our head in just to see if that's the case. But there's a specific vent that is made for that. It's usually a four inch hose that hooks up to what we call a CT4 on the roof. And whenever you turn on your fan, it'll blow out the vent instead of heating the attic. Or on some newer homes, they can either vent that out the, the siding or out the soffit as well. Okay. So cool, let's switch gears now. and Let's say homeowners have identified uh, they definitely need a new roof. Like it's time uh, to get a re-roofing project done. Let's, what should a homeowner know about preparing for that process? What questions should they ask uh, roofers in order to compare uh, different quotations? Give us some advice there. Well, a good place to start is just through your network, asking friends, family, anyone that you know and trust who's had the roof done recently that can recommend a contractor. Or become a member of the Homeowners Advisory or Club. Or become a member of the you, Homeowners Advisory Club. Where you've got access to a directory uh, of trusted service providers that, uh, you know, again, Dan, that's sort of when we first met you, we had started this program. Um, we really liked how you ran your business. We really liked the, the service that you provided to clients. So you became one of our, our trusted go-to guys. And I think that's a, a big factor as well as who you can trust. And, yeah. and then once you're, you're calling in a couple of contractors, what can they expect? What should they expect from a roofer? So in my opinion, a, a roofing estimate process isn't A, it's not one size fits all. B, it shouldn't be something where you're getting emailed a quote or a quote left in your mailbox or a quote given to you after 10 to 15 minutes of interaction. I know everyone's busy, but a roof doesn't get done more than once every 10, 15 or 20 years. And it's a pretty important part of your home. So we take a very different approach in that sense, in terms of any anytime we have a, a homeowner that gets in contact, whether it's from online, a home show, a referral, we like to first start by having a 10 to 15 minute call on the phone, just to ask them some questions, go through what they're looking for, what problems they're having, and what products they may be interested in. Is it a permanent roof? Is it a shingle roof? And that way we can have a really good idea of what to focus on. And then what we do is we go ahead and set up an in-person consultation appointment where myself or one of our representatives or roofing consultants, as we call them, can actually go to the home, take a look in person and sit down with uh, ideally both, both homeowners to go over all the details. And what this could look like is number one, you want to be looking at a few different products because there's so many different shingles out there. Uh, it's worth worth taking a look at. Number two, we would want to give them some more information and just educate them about our company and about the roofing process as a whole so that they're not totally approaching it from an in the dark. They don't know anything. We try and give them a little bit of education. Then number three, we usually have uh, pre-made using satellite imagery, an accurate quote that we're able to go over with them. So all of our quotes, they do contain a bronze, silver, and a gold option. The bronze option is just sort of the basic package, comes with our 10 year guarantee on the workmanship and um, an entry level shingle. The silver option, that's usually what we call a modified or a higher quality asphalt shingle. And it gets coupled with our 20 year warranty. So if anything goes wrong with your roof in the first 20 years, we're coming back to take a look and to fix it for free. And then the third option is usually a gold. So this would be a permanent roofing product, like a steel shingle, sheet metal, standing seam, or Euroshield, where we're giving you a 30 year guarantee on the workmanship and the product typically has a 40 to 50 year guarantee. So that's kind of what our, our appointment process looks like. And that's what maybe you should expect from an options point of view uh, from a roofing company. Excellent, yeah. Very similar uh, in terms of the process that we go through with clients, right? Which, well, there's a good reason for that because it works. Exactly. It's, you know, you're, you're a consultant, you're an advisor, um, you're giving them the information they need to make an informed decision. You're not withholding information. Mm -hmm. and, and again, 
there's always somebody out there who's going to do it for cheaper. But the question you always have to ask is cheaper is usually more expensive in the long run. Mm-hmm. And it's a question of, as you said, uh, you know, workmanship. And if you've got guarantees on the workmanship, not just the product. Yeah. Well, that's that's pretty important. Yeah. And you want to also have a relationship with the company that you're working with because roofs are complicated. There can be things that no one can anticipate or there can be storms. There can be maintenance down the road where you want to know that if the company you're hiring, you're giving that money to, once you pay them, they're still going to pick up the phone. They're still going to come back. They're going to, maybe if you need a favor or you need some help with something, they're not opposed to taking your call and coming back to take a look, even if they're not getting paid to do it. Well, like you've done with me several times where uh, I'll give you a shout about the problems I've been having with these ice dams and, and, and heating cables. And you're, uh, you're coming by and you're having a look, you're going up there and you're making sure you give me that peace of mind, right? You're coming up and you're having a look before the winter and saying, okay, I think everything's in order here. So you're not calling me in the middle of the winter with an emergency. I've got water coming through my, uh, coming through my pot lights. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It's really tough to work on roofs when there's three feet of snow. Absolutely. Okay. Let's wrap up with some common myths, misconceptions that you hear all the time. Uh, things that sort of uh, the general uh, population and homeowners, you know, think about that just isn't true. Yeah, no, that's a fun one. So first one I hear all the time is my roof has a 25 year warranty. It's good for another 10 years, even though it may be 15, 16, 17 years old, the shingles are curling like crazy. The roof clearly needs to be replaced, but there's actually quite a lot of miseducation out there from the manufacturers of shingles typically any any warranty on a roofing product operates on a prorated basis so for those of you who don't know what that means it basically there's a, a period of the warranty where the guarantee on the product compensates you for the full value of what was put on your roof however after that that first point like for these types of shingles a 25 year shingle it's only fully guaranteed for the first 10 years and then after that 10th year in each subsequent year, there's a pretty significant reduction on the compensation you'd get. So for those of you telling me you have a 25-year a guarantee and the roof's still good when it's 20 years old, if you actually tried to call in a warranty, if you were even able to get approval, the amount you're entitled to for compensation would probably be like a few hundred dollars at the most. And you're probably putting in 15 to 20 hours of your time to get that money because there's a whole bunch of hoops you have to jump through. Right. So. That's one I hear all the time. Just because there's a certain warranty on the shingle, it's rigged to make it sound better. Like the new architectural shingles have a 50 year guarantee. They're not gonna last anybody 50 years and it's a heavily prorated warranty. So that's not the best basis to be informed about how long the roof is gonna last. Um, Other misconceptions we hear is just, again, I kind of touched on it before, but if my roof's not leaking, I don't see any water doesn't necessarily mean that your roof's not leaking so it's always better if there's even a doubt to have someone that that knows what they're doing go and take a look awesome awesome is there anything else that you'd like to touch on before we wrap things up this has been like again super informative lots of stuff uh you know we didn't know even uh even someone like me in the industry <clears throat> who's who's going through uh inspection reports on a regular basis but totally this is uh, this has been great information Yeah, well, thanks for listening. I would say it's 2024. It's a brand new year. So we're really excited to have our best season yet. And we're working super, super hard recruiting and hiring new staff so that we can go and service those calls that you guys are going to send us. Um, So whether you're selling your house, you're buying a new home, you're building your dream home. Again, like I said before, that house is always going to have a roof on it. So you know who to call. Yeah, exactly. I remember you made me just think... um, you know, we had a client recently that uh, were selling their house and they just had the roof replaced. I think it was a few couple of years ago, maybe. And, you know, and then the buyer came in, did their inspection and the inspection report found a, a lot of issues there. Yeah. And they were, so they, we uh, we you referred them to you. You went in there and, and uh, maybe tell us a little bit about about that situation. Yeah, well, that's always makes. Yeah, it hurts to see when someone's paid ten, fifteen thousand dollars three years ago and now we're questioning whether any of the roof is uh is still viable and does it all need to be torn off in this particular case the roofing company had said they had installed 
some upgraded ventilation. And once we dug a little bit deeper, we discovered that it didn't take the time to do it properly. So the whole attic, it was one of the, there was more moisture in that attic than I think we had ever seen before. There was mold buildup. There was all these sorts of problems that, you know, was a new roof that had, had been done by a reputable company, quote unquote. So uh, in those types of scenarios, we, we try and do everything we can to salvage what's there and, and not burden the homeowner with having to redo their entire roof. But there was another case that I've, I had jumped up on a roof in Montreal West and it had been done two years ago huge leak inside the house and there was probably 15 or 20 things that were done incorrectly on the roof and there was just nothing else we could say besides that the roof needs to be redone so that's the ultimate worst case scenario um that we see probably a handful of times every year so so all the more reason to do your homework get informed understand you know how things should be done a little bit of uh you know, upfront homework will save you a lot, a lot of time, effort, and headaches in the long run. Yeah, there's a lot of horror stories out there that people hear about roofing gone wrong, and those exist for a reason, is because it does actually happen. So when you're questioning whether to spend thousand dollars, five hundred dollars, fifteen hundred dollars more to work with a company like us that is reputable and is there to to help post installation. That should be your answer. Awesome. So how can we? How can uh, our listeners find you? Where should we go for more information? Well, we got a Facebook page. We're on Google. We have 4.7 stars on Google. All our information's there. Instagram. We got a great website. And then the last thing would be lawn signs in your neighborhood. Awesome. As always, thanks, Stefan. It's been great talking to you. Thanks Thank for you coming. so much. Cheers. All right.